There are moments when it feels like time stands still. But when those moments turn into days, months, years, we start to wonder if life will ever begin again. It is written that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. Now is the time. Well, once again, welcome to church on a long weekend. We're glad to have you along with us. If I haven't met you before, my name is Grant. We've been doing a series called Now is the Time, and I want to welcome all of the families, especially the kids that are here in the room today. For the kids, your parents and I have been on a very interesting journey through a piece of the Bible written by a guy named Solomon. Solomon was a rich and powerful king, but he had a really big problem. And the problem is this. He was learning a tough lesson, and the lesson was that power and money will never satisfy you no matter how much you have. And it's out of that frustration that King Solomon writes these words. They're famous in Scripture from Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them back again. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. I was so grateful for Pastor Lem unpacking that one last week. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. This week, we're getting just past the halfway point on our little journey. We're in verse number six, where it says this. There's a time to search and a time to give up. Let me tell you a story. The only thing worse than losing your dog is losing your friend's dog when your dog's sitting. This happened to Laurel and I, okay? We had been entrusted with our friend's dog, Rose. Rose was a tiny, cute little Yorkshire Terrier We loved having Rose stay in our house, and we lost her. We have no idea how she got out of our fenced backyard. We were all there together. One second she was there, the next second Rose was gone, and we immediately started searching and calling and calling and searching and searching and calling. And following the protocol, Laurel called the police to report a lost dog, which was complicated with the fact that Rose's dad was the deputy chief of police in Linden, which is embarrassing, and we didn't really want them to know we lost their dog until after we had found their dog. Do you know what I'm talking about? We searched and searched, and we could not find Rose. Braden was about 11 at the time, so that dates this whole thing. And Braden decided we should pray that God would help us find Rose. Why is it that kids suggest those kinds of things to adults who should know better, right? Of course, the pastor should have said, we should pray before we search. Didn't occur to me. My 11-year-old brings it to my attention, so we prayed. Probably should have grounded him too, but anyway, for just saying the obvious, Braden prays, and then he goes out looking one more time, and we're going different directions and he circled the block again, the block, same block that we had circled multiple times already. And this time, there's a lady standing out in the cul-de-sac, holding out Rose. And her words were the answer to Braden's prayer. Is this your dog? Well, technically, no. <laughs> but unofficially, absolutely, give me Rose. There was Rose. The lost had been found. And we had a little celebration, and we were so relieved. And yes, we have confessed and repented to our friends John and Caprice, and we're so grateful for their mercy and understanding in those particular moments. You know, when you lose anything of value, you search. And you don't stop searching until you find it. You know why? Because you actually want to find it. It's valuable to you. The Bible says there are parts of life that are so valuable that we should constantly and persistently, as followers of Jesus, be searching for. We're to never give up the search for our entire lifetime. Here's a couple of them, if you want to follow along in your outline. I'm telling you today on this 4th of July weekend, now is the time to search for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. 
The guy who wrote Ecclesiastes 3 also wrote something else when he was in a far better frame of mind. He wrote these words. He said, my son and daughter, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. As a follower of Jesus, you are on an epic, lifelong search for God's wisdom, understanding, and, 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 and all of the pieces that go along with that. Just so you know, human wisdom is really, really good. But it's so far inferior to God's wisdom. Here's what man's wisdom is telling us in our culture today. Man's wisdom is saying, form your own opinion. Decide the rest of the world is just full of a bunch of idiots. And then scream your opinion to everyone, whether they're listening or not. That's what culture is telling us to do. Isn't it interesting that God's wisdom says... Actually pursue God's heart with everything. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry as you have civil conversations with the very people that Jesus wants to hear his voice through you. What are you searching for? Are you searching for validation as you type very, very hard into your keyboard in all caps, trying to tell the world this is how you should think? Can I ask you a question? How has your keyboard evangelism been working for you over the last two and a half years? Has anyone changed their mind? Do you think maybe God's wisdom is so much more superior? You know, one of the ways that Laurel and I seek godly wisdom and counsel is we actually see uh, a professional psychologist and therapist, and we see him on a regular basis. His name is Dr. Patty Ducklap. If you don't like the fact that your pastor goes to see a therapist, you're in the wrong church. Because we don't have a problem with that around here. We all think we need a little help on the side. So here's an interesting thing. Laurel and I decided to do something terrifying. We recorded a podcast with our therapist. You don't think that's a little freaky? What's he going to say about us and our issues, right? We actually had a, a, very, um, a very frank conversation with Patty. I call him Ducky. He calls me Fishy. We've been meeting together for a long time. We talked about handling change and so many other life pieces because we wanted to share Patty's wisdom with you. We had a couple of people eavesdrop on the conversation, our tech guy and Drew and the other guy. They were listening in, and here's what was interesting. They said, yeah, I just listened in on the conversation, and I teared up multiple times because Patty's wisdom just has a way of getting right down into the bottom of your heart. You don't even know he's doing it, and suddenly he's inside of your brain, he's dropped 18 inches into your heart, and you're having conversations that you never, ever thought that you would have. The podcast dropped this weekend, if you've never heard it before, it's called Continuing the Conversation with Grant and Laurel Fishbook. And I tell you, it is definitely worth a listen because Patty gives some life wisdom, godly wisdom that I know will make a difference for you. So we're to be searching for God's wisdom. Secondly, we're supposed to be searching for God's strength and presence. I want you to listen to what the Bible tells us to do today because now is the time. Are you ready? First Chronicles 16. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Did you hear the promise of God in each one of those things? It's simple. If you seek God, he will show up. God's not playing a veritable game of hide and seek, trying to, to mess with his children. That's not the way God works. God is a good father. When you call on him, he's there. The question is, do you have the wisdom to actually stop and listen to what he has to say? If you use God's strength to seek him, the Bible says he will be found by you. Just like with, and when Pastor Angel was out here and we were searching for all of the different pieces, I was actually doing it backstage, right? Found the barrel just like that, which is, pretty good for somebody who is getting older, all right? Why did you giggle? Can I share a milestone for you? I used my 55 and older senior discount for the first time on Friday night. <laughs> Woo! 
I don't know why you're clapping for that, but <laughs> it's a mercy clap. Okay. If you use God's strength to seek him, he will be found by you. What else are we supposed to search for? The Bible says we're supposed to search for God's answers. I love it when my kids ask me questions, even though they are like 28 and 26. When my phone rings and it's McKenna on the other end saying, hey, daddy, how do I fix this in my house? She's a little Joanna Gaines. Loves to fix and do projects. When Braden calls, he's like, hey, Dad, got a question for you. There's something inside of me that just, that just explodes, especially if I know the answer to their question. Well, God is your Father, and this is what he said to you. The Bible says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be <clears throat> opened. My plea for you today is to search for God's answers by asking Him. Don't seek after human wisdom. I promise you it will disappoint you and lead you the wrong direction. When we ask God, he promises that he will answer us. And there's one more piece that we need to talk about for just a few moments. And that's the fact that all of this seeking and searching is sponsored by a God who does exactly that. For a few moments, we've got to talk about God's heart for people who are far from him. As a follower of Jesus, this is one of the, the parts of your journey that you signed up for. And that's to have a constant drive in every season to invite other people into a relationship with the Jesus that you know. Let's face it, that's gotten more challenging over the last couple of years. With the political environment and the cultural environment, it's become more and more difficult for the true followers of Jesus to have civil conversation with people. But the goal is always the same thing. I want you to know the Jesus that I know. Because the Jesus that I know came looking for me. He followed me into dark places, calling me out into the light. I'm working on the wedding of my niece. It's going to happen later on this summer in the center of Saskatchewan up in Canada. Um, Kylie and her fiancé, Hugh, blessed my heart so much when they said, Uncle Grant, so here's the one thing we want to make sure happens at the wedding. We want to make sure that you talk about Jesus. We want to make sure that you talk about Jesus because in that season of joy, we want our friends to actually know and acknowledge the fact that God wrote our love story, that he's present. Why would they make that request? Because a marriage won't last unless God is the foundation. True? It just doesn't last unless God is the foundation. That's why they want God in the center. I did a funeral a while back, and the family wanted to make sure. They said, Grant, we've got one request. Please talk about Jesus. Why did they want that? Because in the season of grief that they were in, they wanted to make sure their friends heard about God. Why did they want their friends to hear about God in the middle of a funeral? Because the end of life is meaningless without a relationship with God that actually lasts for eternity. And he's the only one that can comfort us when we're hurting and give purpose to our pain. We're to be constantly inviting people into the same relationship that we share with Jesus. Well, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories that talk about the heart of a searching and a finding God. There are three stories that actually share God's heart, and they're stories, of course, if you've been around for a while, you recognize a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. I don't have time to share all three stories, but I'm going to give you a bit of a recap. Story number one is about a shepherd who owns a hundred sheep, and just one of them goes missing. And when one of them goes missing, the shepherd stops at nothing. He risks his own life in order to go out and seek and save that lost little one. Why? Because the one that's missing is valuable. Now, people make a mistake all the time and go, I don't understand that. Like, he leaves, like, the 99 faithful ones that didn't wander off, they get left on their own in the middle of nowhere. That's not what Scripture says. In fact, if you understand how shepherding worked back then, shepherds, especially the lead shepherds, always had a series of under-shepherds that were working with them. Those sheep were not abandoned. They were well cared for and protected. But the great shepherd, 
the shepherd of the sheep who knows every single one of them by name, everything about their story. He's the one that says, I will put my life on the line to go and get the one that's lost because that's my heart. When the shepherd finds the sheep, he carries him or her home on his shoulders and throws a celebration for one reason, because what was lost is now found. Second story is a lady who only has a few silver coins, which makes the fact that she has those coins a really, really big deal, and then she loses one. And when she loses one, the Bible says she turns her house upside down looking for that coin. She doesn't eat, she doesn't sleep, she doesn't take a break. She presses in with everything she has until she locates the coin, and when it is found, the most amazing thing happens. She tells her whole neighborhood to celebrate the fact that what was lost is now found. Third story. It's about a dad who has a son, and his son doesn't listen to the wisdom of his father. He listens to the wisdom of the world, and he goes off on his own, and his life is completely messed up. He leaves his father and his family, follows his own wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and he ends up completely alone with absolutely nothing. And I love how the Bible says, it says, and then he came to his senses. He finally had a moment of clarity. His happens in a pig pen, which for a good Jewish boy is not a good place to be. Anybody else in the room had one of those moments of clarity when you thought you were doing so well, everything was perfect, then your life completely tanked, you hit rock bottom and you found out the rock at the bottom was Jesus? (laughs) Well, that's what happens to this kid. So he makes a decision. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home and when his father sees him, He throws off all of his inhibition. Tell me, let me tell you something. Back then, good biblical patriarchs, good dads, they didn't run anywhere. The Bible makes a big deal out of the fact this dad, (laughs) he loses his mind when his son comes over the edge of the horizon and he doesn't care what anybody says or thinks. He runs to his kid, embraces him, throws a party because what was lost is now found. Can I tell you one piece that I want you to walk out of here with on this long weekend? You're the sheep, you're the coin, you're the son. God's the shepherd. God's the searching one. God's the father. And he will stop at nothing to get you home. Now, some of us might say, well, there seems to be a theme here, Grant, that, that God never stops searching for lost people. <laughs> That's true. So then why does Solomon say there's a time to stop searching? Like, how do you put those two together? Well, let's think about it for just a moment. While God never stops searching for people who are far from him, and why, why we should never disengage from the process of introducing other people to Jesus... While God never, ever stops that process, there's a time for us as people to stop searching. But it's not to stop searching for lost people, it's to stop searching for our significance in anyone or anything other than Jesus. So let me be as clear as I can today. Now is the time to stop searching for your significance in anything or anyone other than Christ. What are, the, what are the three elements of life that we most search for our significance in? Let's start with the first one. Stuff. Now's the time to stop searching for significance in our stuff. Earlier in the series, Jesus told us a story about a guy who had a lot of material possessions. Nothing wrong with material possessions as long as you use them for God's glory. Right? To whom much has been given, much will be required. Okay? This guy's entire life was built around what he owned. And, and, and not who he was. He found his significance in his portfolio. And he owns so much that he actually has to tear down his storage units in order to build bigger ones. And on the night he thinks he's finally arrived, I mean, he finally gets to this, whatever financial benchmark he wants to get to, he, he makes this reasoning. I've arrived, I'm gonna eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I might die. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. God 
God shows up and says, I know you just finished your building project, but time's up. And then he gives him a name for anyone who finds their worth in their wallet. You guys have heard me talk about this for 23 years. God calls him not an entrepreneur, not a great type A leader. He calls him a fool. In fact, let me quote God. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what, then, then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And then God says, and this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. You are not your stuff. Your stuff can't save you and your stuff will end up in somebody's trash heap eventually. That should be perspective we all hold on to. So stop searching for your significance in what you own. Secondly, stop searching for your significance in yourself. And don't get me wrong, okay? Loving yourself and who God created you to be, that's important. But when you find your significance in your status, your title, your grades, your football stats, your bank account, your friends, your accomplishments, when you find your significance there, you're not finding your significance in God. Period. I mean, the Apostle Paul was about, outside of Jesus, was about the biggest deal to the New Testament church that you could find. These are he, his words when he talks about Himself, when he reflects on where he finds his significance, he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. These are powerful words. Paul says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So there it is. Why should you stop searching for significance in you? Because significance is only found in the one who made you. I love telling you this. This may be a shock, but the universe doesn't revolve around you. I, really? The universe doesn't revolve around you. <clears throat> Country doesn't revolve around you. So here is my question. If the world does not revolve around you, why not find your worth in the one who revolves the world? Last one. Stop searching for significance in someone else's opinion. Boy, we are so obsessed with making sure that everybody's okay with us. As I said, for the last 23 years, you've been hearing me say this. I would rather be a fool in the eyes of a man than a fool in the eyes of God. You know what inspired that saying? It actually came from Proverbs 29, 25. It says this, the fear of man, which proves to be a snare, will be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. Significance comes from knowing and having a relationship with the one who made you, created you, blessed you with whatever stuff you have. And to be frank, his opinion is the only one that matters. Because at the end of eternity, he's the only one you're going to answer to. As Braden carried Rose back home again, <clears throat> he was flooded with relief and joy. When we saw Rose with Braden, we were flooded with relief and joy. There was a time to search. There was a time for the lost to be found. I'm glad we didn't give up searching that day. And I'm so grateful that Jesus didn't give up searching for me when I was off chasing my own way. I'm also grateful that even though God will never stop pursuing us, that there's a time for us to stop searching for significance in anyone other than Jesus. And my prayer is that as we continue to walk through Ecclesiastes 3, that we will hold those truths deeply evident in our own hearts. So we wanted to finish our time together today with, with just more worship because we think that's important. 
We believe one of the ways that we find significance in God is by worshiping Him. And so I'm going to pray. The band's going to come back, and we're actually going to spend just a little bit of time at the end worshiping God, and then we're going to kick you loose into the commons if you're here. We want to celebrate with you. We've got, like, popsicles and all that kind of fun stuff. And I know it's cold and rainy outside, but you get the idea, okay, right? It's supposed to be summer. So let's pretend, <laughs> all right? Let's just pretend, all right? I heard it was hot last weekend while we were gone. That's all the summer you're getting, so just deal with it and if you need therapy listen to the podcast it'll help okay all right let's pray together god thank you for a long weekend when we can take an extra breath and thank you for both freedom and independence but god in 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 giving a day to that may we never lose sight of having a lifetime of being dependent on you so lord jesus i thank you and i celebrate with my family and friends today you God, thank you that you came to seek and save the lost. Thank you that you never gave up searching for us. God, thank you that you knew where we were every moment. That your heart is to come after us and then to bless us with your wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding. God, thank you that your answers are available to us. May we seek them with all of our heart. Lord, may we never, may we never find our significance in anything other than you. So God, today, if we have been finding significance in stuff, self, or someone else's opinion, God, we repent. And we come back to you and you alone. So Jesus, for all my friends in the room and those watching at home and at campsites around the country, Lord, I thank you that now is the time. We pray these things. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Hey, let's stand and worship together.